So good every good afternoon, everyone. My name is Victoria Hawk, and I am the Shorebird Data Quality Manager for the Shorebird Program at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. First off, I want to thank each of you uh, here for your interest in monitoring shorebirds and seabirds. Florida's extensive shorebird monitoring program is only possible because of the dedication of people like you. Your monitoring elf efforts help us locate nests and chicks so that we can protect them, identify threats so that we can manage them, and detect trends in populations so that we can track local species. Once again, on behalf of all shorebirds and seabirds that nest in Florida, thank you for your participation. We have two main goals to cover today. The first is to review our monitoring how we monitor shorebirds and seabirds using our standardized protocol, the breeding bird protocol for Florida's seabirds and shorebirds, which is a bit long, so I'll be referring to it as the protocol during this presentation. We're also going to review how to enter monitoring data into the Florida shorebird database, which I'll refer to as either the FSD or the database. The FSD is our online database where you will be entering the data you collect. It is the repository that tracks nesting shorebird and seabird data in Florida. I want to remind you all that it is important to connect with your local Florida Shorebird Alliance partnership. For those somewhat new to shorebird monitoring, the Florida Shorebird Alliance, abbreviated as FSA, is the statewide network of local partnerships committed to advancing shorebird and seabird conservation here in Florida. Your local partnership coordinators can help direct you to areas that need additional cover coverages. Um, some locations may already have adequate numbers of monitors surveying them. They can also connect you with other monitors and point you to important local resources. If you are unsure what partnership you are in or who to contact, visit the FSA's website and check out the Partnership tab to explore the different partnership pages. Here you can find contact information for each partnership coordinator, and you can also contact the Florida Shorebird Alliance Coordinator, Shay Armstrong at shorebird at myfwc.com. The FSD and the FSA websites are two great resources to visit for additional training materials, identification guides, annual reports, and video tutorials, including a recording of this webinar. The Breeding Bird Protocol provides standardized methods for data collection. When data is collected the same way across the state, we can track population status and trends. These data are used to inform management decisions locally and statewide. A link to the protocol was emailed to you prior to the webinar and can also be found on the FSD website under the resource tab. Feel free to have a copy open as we continue. Even though many of you are familiar with the breeding bird protocol, we recommend reviewing the protocol each year in preparation for the upcoming breeding season. This helps to keep the information fresh in your mind and keep you up to date with any new updates. Each year, we review the protocol and make adjustments based on partner feedback and questions received throughout the previous seasons. This year, the protocol was updated to include clearer instructions for reporting additional breeding adults observed on route, and this change can be seen on page 7 of the protocol. This is not a new protocol that we are introducing. It is just updated language so that the instructions on how to collect this data are hopefully less confusing. The protocol provides instructions on how to monitor shorebird and seabird breeding populations. So these are the counts of adult breeding birds, nesting, chick rearing, and staging locations, nest outcomes, so whether or not a nest successfully hatched, as well as any threats and or disturbances that might be present. This could be predation, anthropogenic causes, or anything else that threatens successful nesting. There are 20 species of seabirds and shorebirds that nest throughout Florida, but not all of these species nest statewide. For example, three of these species only nest in the dry tortugas. It is unlikely that you will observe all these birds nesting where you are surveying, but we still ask that you pay attention for all species listed here, as you never know when the birds will decide to try something new and unusual. 
Focus your efforts specifically on monitoring the 12 species listed here in bold. These are the species you are most likely to see if you conduct coastal route surveys and include species that are state threatened. If you would like to learn more about state threatened species plans and species action plans in Florida, you can go to myfwc.com. Pictured here are four state listed shorebirds that breed in Florida. Clockwise from the top left, we have the American oyster catcher, the snowy plover, the black skimmer, and the least tern. Shorebird breeding season typically starts in March and goes through the end of August. Depending on species, weather, and where you survey in the state, you may see birds on nest as early as February or even still tending to unfledged young as late as October. The protocol designates six count windows, which are week-long survey windows from March to August, and the dates for these count windows are the same every year. At a minimum, we ask FSA partners, that's all of you, to commit to surveying during each count window. Surveying during these monthly count windows provides us with a statewide snapshot of breeding activity and limits the chance of double counting birds moving between areas in the state. We recommend surveying weekly once nests are observed where you are surveying. Weekly surveys provide a better estimate of peak counts and increase our understanding of nest outcomes and causes of nest failure. Few reminders about basic monitoring etiquette to keep you and the birds safe. When you are surveying a route, be sure to avoid disturbing the birds as much as possible. If birds change their behavior in response to you, such as broken wing, alarm calls, flushing, dive bombing, etc., uh, you need to back up as you're a little bit too close to their nests or chicks. You want to give the birds enough space that they can properly care for their chicks and nests. Also beware of potential predators. Flushing birds from their nests or from chicks when predators are nearby may result in predation. It's also important to not enter any posted areas. These are areas that have keep out or do not enter signs or symbolic fencing. You need a permit from Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to access these areas. If you see a nest or colony that is not posted, it is likely the land manager does not know about it. Alert landowners and managers about any new sites you find so they can post the area to keep people from disturbing the birds. If you're not sure who the land manager or landowner is, you can contact FWC staff. Your regional shorebird biologist is a great resource and you can find their contact information on the FSD website underneath the help tab. We can break down monitoring ground nesting shorebirds and seabirds into three basic steps. Conduct a route survey, document any nests, colonies, and chicks or young observed on the route. And lastly, enter all this data into our online database at www.flshorebirddatabase.org. To aid in data collection, we provide four data sheets. These can be found at the end of the breeding bird protocol on pages 20 through 23, as well as on the FSD's website under the resource tab. The route form will be filled out under step one and all other forms will be used in step two. Let's start by reviewing step one, conduct a route survey. Every time you conduct a route survey, you will complete a route form. Even if you were not able to finish surveying the entire route, or you do not observe any breeding birds, chicks, or young on the route. When filling out a route form, you will record observers' date and time, how you surveyed the route, the route, such as did you walk it, did you use an ATV or a boat? Also, if you surveyed the entire route or just a portion of it, you'll also report the additional breeding adult count. More on these counts later and you can provide any comments of unusual or interesting things that you saw, such as disturbance events or banded birds. There may be times when you are not able to conduct an entire survey. Storms, time restraints, ties, et cetera, may cause you to cut a survey short. But if you find yourself doing partial route surveys very often, the route may need to be broken down into more logistically feasible segments. Or if there's no suitable habitat left on the route, the route may be, need to be retired. You can always contact 
FL Shorebird database at myfwc.com for advice about routes. If you attended any of the preseason par partnership meetings this year, you likely already heard about the protocol update regarding additional breeding adult counts. So every year we review the breeding bird protocol and make adjustments based on partner feedback and questions received throughout the previous season. This year, the protocol was updated to include clear instructions for reporting additional breeding adults observed on route. We ask you to collect additional breeding adult counts for three focal shorebird species. American oyster catchers, pictured on this slide at the top, snowy plover, pictured middle, and Wilson's plover, pictured on the bottom. Big picture, what we want to know is how many adults for these three species are breeding on each route that you survey. The total number of breeding shorebirds per species on a route will come from counts of adults at nest, adults with chicks, and any other additional adults breeding on route. The additional breeding adult count is not a count of all birds seen on route, but rather just those who are actually breeding on route but are not seen with their nest or brood. And you can see the full definition for that on page seven of the protocol. Birds that can be counted as additional breeding adults include birds that are likely to nest this season, such as territorial pairs or birds exhibiting other breeding behaviors. You can also count birds that currently have nests or chicks on your route, but were not observed with them. And you can count birds that had a nest or chick that already failed this season. Again, not all adult shorebirds on your route will be counted as additional breeding adults. Birds that are excluded from this count include birds observed at a nest or with chicks. These adults do not get counted as they are already counted as part of a solitary site visit or roving chick observation. Also not counted are breeding adults from other routes or rooftops that are um, sometimes breeding birds that are nesting but not on your route that you are surveying will visit your route. They do not get counted as additional breeding adults on your route, but they will get counted as adults on route or on their rooftops where they're breeding. Behavior should give these birds away. These will be single birds or pairs loafing or foraging along a route, but not displaying nesting behavior nor have a nest on route. They will likely be observed at different locations on the route, either on the same survey or on subsequent surveys. Non-breeding birds are also not counted as additional adults. These include birds that are too young to breed and breeding age adults that are not breeding during the season. Um, they might be migrants or they are unable to attract a mate or they are unable to hold a territory. These birds may be alone or in small flocks and are not defending territories or exhibiting other nesting behaviors. Birds that are known or are likely non-breeders should not be counted as additional breeding adults on your route because they are not actively breeding during the season. Note that for some species, plumage is not going to be a reliable indicator that a bird is breeding. For example, American oyster catchers do not breed until they are three to five years old, but they can have full adult plumage before then. So behavior is the best indicator that a bird is breeding. Sometimes you'll find it challenging to determine if a bird should be counted as an additional breeding adult on your route. If you are unsure, you can ask yourself a few questions about the birds. Are they by themselves or paired off? Have you been regularly seeing them in the same area on your route? Are they present on route during peak nesting season? Um, for oyster catchers, that's March 1st through June 24th. For snowy plovers, that's March 10th through June 19th, and for Wilson's plovers, that's April 14th through June 24th. You can also ask if they're exhibiting any breeding behaviors like actively defending territory, but no nest has yet been documented. If you can answer yes to any to these four questions, then these birds are likely nesting on your route and can be counted as additional breeding adults. Identifying additional breeding adults on your route takes time and patience, even for experienced monitors. If you're unsure how to count adults on your route, it's helpful to collaborate with other shorebird monitors in your area. Remember to reach out to your local partnership for guidance and resources.
This is an example of a route form for a route survey for our Amelia Island route conducted during the first count window. The observers surveyed the route by walking and were able to complete an entire route survey. They used tallies to keep track of, the ten of additional breeding adults on route for a total of three oyster catchers, zero snowy plovers, and eight Wilson's plovers. They also saw a small group of oyster catchers roosting together. They determined that these birds were not breeding, so they did not include them as additional breeding adults and instead recorded them in the comment section. This route happens to be on the Atlantic coast where snowy plovers do not breed, so they will always report zero breeding adults for snowy plovers when they survey this route. If you're actively looking for additional breeding adults on your route during your survey, but do not see any, please record zero. Absent data is important too, as it lets us know with certainty what areas birds are not using. All right, so step two is to document any nesting adults, chicks, or young observed on the route survey using the shorebird nest form, the seabird colony form, and the roving chick staging young form. Let's start with shorebirds. So this is page eight and nine in the protocol. Shorebirds nest individually, so each shorebird nest is a site and gets its own shorebird nest form pictured here. You'll use the same data sheet to document a new site and document a site visit. Each time you find a new site, you'll need to give the nest a unique name, report if it is a re-nest, and take a GPS point. When a breeding pair has previously attempted to nest during the current breeding season, then initiates another nest after that, that other nest is considered a re-nest. The first nest of a breeding pair has in a season is referred to as the original nest. Uh, when you take a GPS point, a nearby point is okay. It's important to avoid flushing the birds from the nest. If you're worried about finding the site again, you can use the comment section to note some landmarks or your position relative to the nest. After documenting the new nest site, you will need to complete a site visit. You will do a site visit for any shorebird nest sites seen during a route survey, including any new sites found during the survey. Each time you conduct a site visit, you will record the status of the nest, and if the nest is no longer active, its final outcome, the species, the nesting behavior exhibited by the adults, if one or both of the adults are present, as well as the egg and nestling counts if they are visible, and any relevant comments. You can also report potential threats and disturbances using the optional information section. The shorebird nest form has three categories, probable nesting, active, and no longer active. Probable nesting is for cases where you strongly suspect that there is a nest nearby, but you don't wanna disturb the birds to investigate. Active means you saw the nest with viable eggs or nestlings, or saw an adult bird incubating or brooding, or the bird performed displays to draw you away from the area, like broken wing display. No longer active is when the nest has ended and is no longer tended to by the adults. And if you can see the nest cup, uh, there will be no viable eggs or chicks left in the nest. This could be because the eggs have hatched and any chicks present have left the nest, the nest was abandoned or destroyed, or sometimes the nest is going to be gone and you're not sure what has happened to it. Detecting solitary shorebird nests is often best done by first watching a shorebird's behavior. If you see a bird incubating, brooding nestlings, or giving the broken wing display, it means a nest is present. All three of these behaviors can be reported as an active nest site. Pictured on the top is an example of an American oyster catcher incubating eggs. The middle picture of this slide is a snowy plover brooding nestlings in the nest, and on the bottom is a Wilson's plover performing a broken wing display. Don't confuse a bird brooding nestlings with a bird brooding roving chicks. When a bird is brooding nestlings, they are at the nest site and it is likely that one or more of the eggs are still hatching. When an adult is brooding roving chicks, they are not at a nest site and are documented using the roving chick staging young form. 
In our example shorebird nest form, a pair of Wilson's plovers were observed and one of the adults is in incubating posture. After observing the nest from a distance that does not disturb the birds, the incubating adult gets up from the nest and three eggs and zero nestlings can be seen inside the nest cup. So the nest status is reported as active, the nesting behavior as incubating, and the counts of three eggs, zero nestlings, and two adults are recorded on the data sheet. If the nest is active, but you're unsure if eggs or nestlings are present in the nest cup, you can report unknown for both. This may happen near the time that the nest hatches and you're not sure if there's chicks or if there is eggs, so or if there is both. If you know eggs or nestlings are present in the nest cup but are not able to count them, you can report them as present. We want you to give us as much information as you can gather from a distance that is safe for the birds. It is okay to not collect some data if collecting it disturbs the birds. Let's say the same nest is checked again a few days later. This time, no adults are in the area and there are no eggs in the nest. It's too soon for the eggs to have hatched and there are ghost crab tracks in and around the nest as well as a burrow next to it. In this case, the nest status will be reported as no longer active and the final outcome as no eggs hatched and um, document the evidence that crabs were the likely cause of the nest being predated. Once a nest is given a final outcome, you no longer have to visit the site during route surveys. If the adults from the nest try to nest again, that nest will be considered a new nest site and also a renest. Shorebird chicks are highly mobile and may travel miles from their natal nest shortly after hatching. Any shorebird chicks observed outside of the nest are considered roving chicks and are documented using the roving chick staging young form. It is not common, but sometimes you may observe shorebird chicks that are still in the nest. These chicks are considered nestlings and can be reported on the shorebird nest form. This is an example of how to report a nestling on the shorebird nest form. In this example, one egg and one nestling were, in, uh, the, were observed in the nest with both adults nearby. The site status is marked as no longer, the, oh, I'm sorry. The nest status is marked as active and the count table includes one nesting found in the nest with one egg. This is common, but this is not common, but it is possible. So sorry about that. That X that is on no longer active should in fact be on active because if there's eggs and nestlings in the nest, um, the, the nest is still active. So that slide, apologies for that, is not exactly correct. If you find a shorebird roving chick, you will report it using the roving chick staging young form. You will need to document the location of the chick or chicks, the habitat they are using, the species, the number of adults and chicks, the natal nest if known, and any relevant comments. Are any of the birds banded? Any interesting interactions? You can also use the bottom section to document any potential threats or disturbances. Both roving chicks and staging young are reported by chick age classes, which are downy, feathered, and flight capable. You can see them pictured in that order on the left-hand side of the slide. And you can check page 15 of the protocol for more information about these guys. Downy chicks include chicks from newly hatched up to one and a half or two weeks old, depending on the species. They are covered in downy feathers and look very fuzzy. They're small and stay close to their parents. In the case of shorebird chicks, when recently hatched chicks are found in the nest bowl, they are recorded as nestlings. And as soon as they leave the nest bowl, they're reported as roving downy chicks. Feather chicks are about one and a half to three weeks old and they have pin feathers. Um, some may have some little bit of down left, but overall there are more feathers than down. They're bigger and more mobile and have a scruffy appearance, but are still noticeably smaller than adults. Flight-capable juveniles are capable of flight. About three to four weeks after hatching, they have learned to fly and can fly in short bursts. As soon as they're able to do this, we begin counting them as flight-capable juveniles. These chicks are almost the same size as an adult at this point. 
Here's an example of a roving chick staging young form. There were three downy Wilson's clover chicks observed foraging on the beach with one adult. The observers record the species as Wilson's clover, three downy chicks, zero feathered and zero flight capable chicks, one adult, and beach as the habitat type. In this case, the natal nest for these chicks is known, so they recorded it. A natal nest is the nest from which the chicks hatched. You can only assign natal nests for shorebirds. We ask that you give us the natal nest name whenever possible and encourage you to sign a natal nest if you know the happenings of your route and are relatively confident. This route was surveyed weekly and the observers know that even though there are multiple Wilson's plovers nests in the area, this particular nest, AI Whipple 01, is the only nest that was near its hatch date at the time of this survey. In some parts of the state, survey conditions like abundant vegetation will make observing young roving chicks very challenging. In these cases, you can still report roving chicks if you are confident that the breeding pair has a brood based on the adult's behavior even if you are unable to visually confirm the presence of chicks. The, uh, the, sorry, the behavior of adults with broods may differ by species. We updated our guidance back in 2022 on how to report these observations to make data collection and entry standardized and hopefully easier. You can fill out the data sheet as you normally would and check off the suspected age of the unseen chicks. Report zero for the other ages. In this example, the natal nest hatched a little over two weeks ago, so the chick or chicks should be feathered. You can document this information further in the comments if you desire. In this example, they put no chicks seen, but present based on adult behavior. You also need to fill out the seabird colony form anytime you survey a colony. Seabirds nest collectively in colonies that can be comprised of one or more species nesting together. Colonies are discussed on page 10 and 11 in the protocol. You will use the same data sheet to document a new colony site as well as document a colony site visit. When you observe a new colony, you will need to give that colony a unique name and collect location data. Colonies cover an area, so you'll need to collect at least three GPS points. Colonies may shift or grow or shrink in size over the breeding season, and if this happens, you can collect new GPS coordinates to reflect these changes. Just like solitary nest sites, it's important to alert landowners and managers of new colonies, especially if they are not yet posted. After documenting the new colony site, we will need to complete a site visit. You will do a site visit for any seabird colony sites observed during a route survey, including any new sites found during that survey. When conducting a site visit to a colony, you will need to record the status of the colony. If the colony is no longer active, you'll also need to report its final outcome, so whether it's successful or not. You'll need to report counts of nests chicks and adults, if there was any major loss, if the site was posted, and any comments that you might have. And again, like all the other data sheets, there is an, a section for reporting optional information about disturbances and potential threats to the colony. The seabird colony form has two status categories, active and no longer active, which are similar to nest status or solitary nests. Active means you saw at least one bird in the colony in incubating or brooding posture, or and or at least one chick is present in the colony. No longer active is when the colony has ended and there are no longer any nests or chicks left in the colony. A colony's final outcome will report if the colony was successful, so if at least one flight capable chick was produced from the colony or if the colony was unsuccessful, it was abandoned or destroyed before producing any flight capable young. Or sometimes the colony might just disappear and you're not going to be really sure of what happened to it. 
When conducting a seabird colony survey, you will be counting all nests, chicks, and adults in or very near the colony. You are unlikely to be able to see individual nests in the colony, so nests are counted by counting the number of adults in incubating posture. When counting seabirds, we ask you to report the count type because it lets us know how you counted the birds, which gives us a sense for the accuracy of those numbers. There are four different count types for colonies, direct, extrapolated, presence or absence, and did not check. Count types are defined on pages 12 through 14 of the breeding bird protocol, and different survey conditions are going to dictate what count type you use. Whenever possible, you should conduct a direct count. Use this count when you're able to see and count everything in the colony, all nests, all chicks, and all adults. And the number you're reporting is the true actual number. You may need to move around to count the entire colony. Start with nests and count all nests. And remember, nests are counted by counting incubating adults at least twice and report the average of your counts as the direct count of nests. For larger colonies, it's good to have help. If you are counting a colony with other surveyors, each surveyor can count once and then report the average of everyone's count as the direct count. Repeat this process for chicks and total adults as well. And do not try to conduct multiple counts at the same time. That'll get real confusing real fast. In this example, I visited a colony and I was able to see and count the entire colony. On my first visit, on my first count, sorry, of nests, I counted 50. And on my second, I counted 52. So I take the average of these, 51, and report that as my direct count of nests for this colony. Should you find yourself unable to conduct a direct count, try to conduct an extrapolated count. This is a less accurate count, but still provides good information on the size of the colony. Extrapolated counts are used when either your view of the colony is significantly obstructed, this could be due to vegetation or big topography things like dunes, um, no matter where you move you cannot see the whole colony. Or the colony might just be so large that you do not have time to conduct a direct count for the entire colony. An extrapolated count is not a guess, it is a calculation based on the proportion of the colony that you can conduct a direct count of. So let's walk through an example. The example colony pictured here has a large dune running through it. It is not feasible to conduct a direct count because no vantage point or combination of vantage points is going to allow you to view and count the entire colony. Instead, you conduct an extrapolated count using the calculation protocol found on page 13 of the protocol. So step one. You position yourself where you can see as much of the colony as possible. Step two, you delineate the viewable portion of the colony as your count area. In this example, you can see the portion of the colony shaded in light green on the, it's the larger section, and you cannot see the portion of the colony shaded in dark green. That's blocked by, that's the smaller section. You conduct a direct count of the nests in this viewable portion of the colony. Remember, a direct count is the average of two counts. In this example, your direct count of nests in the viewable portion ends up being 450. Step three, you determine approximately what percent of the entire colony your direct count area covers. Here, you approximate that you counted 75% of the entire colony. Step four, now you divide your direct count by the proportion of the colony counted to get your extrapolated count. So for this example, you divide 450 by 0.75 for a total of 600 nets. For decimal values, round to the nearest whole number and then repeat this process for chicks uh, for all three age classes as well as adults. If you don't have time for a direct or extrapolated count, you can report present or absent. These count types at least let us know whether a colony is active in the area. If you use present in lieu of a count, know that present equals one. When we do any type of analysis, we are only able to say with any certainty that there is at least one. If you are time limited, please consider doing an extrapolated count, especially when counting adults in the colony. 
Marking absent indicates that you are able to verify that there were zero nests or zero chicks in the colony. It's the equivalent of reporting a direct count of zero. If you cannot confirm presence or absence, uh, say for example, a storm came through and you suspect chicks are still present in the colony but are doing a really good job of hiding, you can report back did not check. There are additional count types used to monitor rooftops described in the breeding bird protocol, and they only apply to rooftop monitoring. As a reminder for anyone interested, there is a rooftop training webinar that's being held tomorrow um, on Thursday, March 9th from 1 to 2.30. Let's go back to fill out the seabird colony form. In this example, the colony is mixed and has black skimmers and least terns nesting in it. Adults from both species are observed in incubating postures, so the colony status is reported as active. No was reported for major loss since this is the first time this particular colony was observed. Major loss is used to report when 25% or more of the colony is lost, either a large number of chicks died or nests fail between visits. Some common causes for major loss are predation events or weather events that cause overwash. Um, the entire colony in this example is visible and nothing obstructs the view. So a direct count was used to document nests, chicks, and adults. The observers reported a direct count of 32 adults in incubating posture for black skimmers. There were no chicks in the colony yet of any age class, so they reported zero, direct count of zero for all of them. When counting adults, count the total number of adults in the colony. This includes counting adults in incubating posture. Because of this, your adult count should almost always be greater than your nest count. Repeat this for least turn counts, and the observers got a direct count of eight least turn nests, zero chicks for all age classes, and 24 adults. Let's talk about seabird chicks. If seabird chicks are within sight of their active colony, they should be counted as part of the active colony on the seabird colony form. Seabird chicks of any age class can be documented as part of the seabird colony form. If you observe flight capable juveniles and you don't see their colony from where you are, you can count them on a roving chick staging young form. This is the same form we went over already for shorebird roving chicks. The difference is you can only report like capable seabird chicks on this farm. You can't report downy or feathered chicks as they should still be within the colony. Here's an example of a seabird colony with fledglings still within sight of the colony. This colony has adults and flight capable chicks, so this colony is still active and counts are made in their relevant columns. As soon as all flight capable chicks leave this colony, it will be marked as no longer active with a final outcome of one or more flight capable chicks were produced. If a group of flight capable young and adults are observed away from their colony, then use the roving chick staging young form. Again, this is the same form we used when documenting roving chicks. The example form here is documenting least turn young. A flock of flight capable juveniles are not within sight of any colony. So the GPS location was taken for them and the area was recorded to be posted, not posted, sorry. Um, and then the, the species and the total number of flight capable young and adult presence with these young were counted and recorded as well as the habitat type they were seen in. If you see banded birds on your surveys, please document and report these observations. Remember to record the species of the bird, the color and position of any bands and flags, if there are codes on any of the bands or flags, an approximate GPS location, date and time of observation, and if possible, take a photograph. You can visit the FSA's banded bird page to learn where to report banded birds. Who you report banded birds to varies by species and band combinations. The banded bird page can be found by going to the FSA's website and clicking on the banded birds link under the resource tab.
You can also find guidance on how to collect and record band information. We do not currently have dedicated fields in the FSD to report banded birds, but you can include this information in the comments. The final step of monitoring shorebirds, this is step three, is entering your data online into the Florida Shorebird Database. We only have a limited amount of time to walk you through the basic steps, um, but you can contact us anytime during the season with any questions you have, and we are more than happy to help guide you through data entry. We ask that you enter your data into the Florida Shorebird Database, whether you survey monthly or more frequently. The FSD typically opens for data entry on March 1st and typically closes on October 1st. If you have late season nesting that you continue to monitor into September and October, let us know and we can work with you to get that data into the database even after the FSD has closed for the season. The first step in entering data is to create your own Florida Shorebird database account if you don't already have one then log in. Anytime you're using the FSD, it's best to use Google Chrome as your browser. If you can't remember your login information, don't have Google Chrome, or have other issues with the database, you can email questions to flshorebirddatabase at myfwc.com. This is your My Data page, where you will be able to see all routes, breeding sites, and rooftops that you monitor listed here. If you are new to the FSD, these boxes will be empty. If you are a returning surveyor, any routes and rooftops you've added to your My Data page in past years will automatically display here. All the data forms we went over today are entered into the database when you enter a route survey. So in order to enter a route survey, you first need to add routes to your profile if they are not already there. Remember, lots of routes already exist in the database, and multiple people could be surveying the same route as you. If you want to add a route to your profile, first check to see whether it already exists in the database. To do this, click the blue Add Routes button. Search for a route either by FWC region or county. The routes will appear in a list and on the map. Select the route or routes you want to add to your profile by checking the checkbox next to the route name, then click Add to My Routes. The selected route or routes will now appear on your profile on the My Breeding Data page. If you are absolutely certain that the route you surveyed doesn't already exist, you can create a new route in the database. To do this, click on the Create New Route button at the bottom of the page. This will bring you to the Establish a New Route page. Here you can create a new route by drawing the route on the map using Capture Click method, or you can enter a series of coordinates. You'll need to give your route a unique name and provide descriptive details such as how to access the route, where to park, where you want to start and end your route survey. After you've done all that, you can click down at the bottom on the Submit button and your new route will display for you in your My Routes box. Once you have added routes to your profile, they will appear here in the My Routes box. Now you're ready to enter your route survey data. Click on the Add Survey button next to the route you want to enter a survey for. This will bring you to the Routes Report Route Survey page, which is equivalent to the route form we talked about. Enter the data about the route survey from your route form, and once you've completed step one, the route form, you'll click on continue to step two. Step two is where you enter information from the shorebird nest form, the seabird colony form, and the roving chick staging young forms. Use the add sites to route button near to enter any new sites. Then click on the enter visit button next to each site to enter the site visit information. Click on the Enter Roving Chick Staging Young button to enter any chick or young observations. In 2022, we had made several updates on how you enter roving chick observations into the database. These changes were made in response to partner feedback and with the aim of making it easier to enter data. It's a quick summary of some of the changes we did to improve the way you report roving chick observations were determining the 
sorry, we improved the way you report roving chick observations where chicks were determined to be present based on adult behavior, but not visually confirmed. Previous guidance required you to enter counts of zero for all age classes and then enter an explanation in the comments. Now we have added a yes, no selection to indicate if chicks were visually observed. Yes will automatically be selected as most chick observations for chicks will be visually confirmed. If no chicks were visible, but were determined to be present based on adult behavior, click on the no box. This will change the check fields to check boxes and you can check off the field for the age of the checks that you that went unseen. The FSD also now allows for multiple broods of the same species to be entered on one roving chick observation. This means if you have two Wilson's plovers broods hanging out together in the same location, you can now report both on the same roving chick record. Previously, these would have had to be two separate observations. Enter each brood as a separate entry, especially if the natal nest for one or more of the broods is known. In this example, one is known and one is unknown. We also expanded the information available when selecting natal nest. Previously, it was a drop down menu of nests within a specific, specified radius from your observation. And now we provide a list of nests with a lot of additional information. In the top table, nests within an adjustable radius from the roving chick record you are ent entering are displayed. The last status for each nest, distance from the observation you are entering, and most previous roving chick record entered for the nest. When you select a nest, when you select a nest from this list, all previous roving chick observations entered for the nest are displayed. Once you have selected the nest, click confirm selection. We hope that these changes made it easier to enter data last year and continue to be easier this year. If you have questions about entering roving chick observations during the season or want to suggest improvements to this or other sections of the database, let us know. You can email us with questions, comments, suggestions anytime at flshorebirddatabase at myfwc.com. We, we really do want to know how we can make it easier for you to enter data. After entering all your site visits, roving chick observations, and staging young observations, don't forget to enter your additional breeding adult counts that you have for your route. If you looked but did not see any, please report zero. If you are unable to look for potential or for additional breeding adults, click on the drop down menu to select did not count. Otherwise, just click on the field to enter a numeric count. After all your data has been entered, be sure to review your route survey to make sure all information was entered correctly and is free of typos. If you need to edit any of the site visit information you entered, you can click the appropriate edit button. When you are finished entering and reviewing your data, scroll to the bottom of the page and click Submit Route Survey. If something comes up during data entry and you cannot finish entering all your route survey information, you can also click on the Save and Finish Later button. And then the next time you log in, the database will prompt you to finish that survey. If you want to view your route surveys, see the surveys that other monitors have entered for a route or need to update any information on route surveys you have already entered, click on the view edit in the My Routes box. So to sum up, there are four main steps to entering data in the FSD. Sign into your FSD account, check for existing routes, or if a route does not exist, create a new one. Thirdly, add a route survey. So enter route survey data, check for existing sites, or if they don't exist, create new ones. Report site visits to solitary shorebird nest and seabird colonies, and also report any chick or young observations. And your last step is to view or edit your route surveys as needed. The Breeding Bird Protocol, data forms, quick guides, webinar recordings, and other helpful training videos are all available on the resource tab of the FSD website. Keep in mind that the 2023 webinar recordings will not be available immediately, but you can find the 2022 webinar recordings until then. 
Also check out the FL Shorebird Alliance website for additional resources about bird identification, chick age guides, the monthly rack line newsletter, and so much more. And remember, again, you can contact us anytime with questions about the protocol or data entry at FL Shorebird Database at myfwc.com. So thank you all so much for attending this webinar and for continuing to make the Florida Shorebird Monitoring Program a success. We do have quite a bit of time for questions, so feel free to either use the chat box or raise your hand.